All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Harmony Barker. I am the Public Programs Manager at Holocaust Museum LA, the first and oldest Holocaust, uh, Holocaust survivor founded museum in the United States. We were founded in 1961 by survivors who wanted to create a safe space to display their precious artifacts and to remember their family members and loved ones who had perished and to educate future generations on the important lessons of the Holocaust. Today, the museum continues to provide free Holocaust education to students from around Los Angeles, the United States and the world, fulfilling the mission of our founders to commemorate, educate and inspire. Thank you for joining us for today's program, the Shoah Stories from North Africa. The Holocaust is usually understood as a European story, yet this pivotal episode unfolded across North Africa and reverberated through politics, literature, memoir, and memory, Muslim as well as Jewish, in the post-war years. From the implementation of race laws and forced labor across the Maghreb, to the long-term impact on Muslim-Jewish relations, the events of the Holocaust in North Africa set the stage for an entirely new post-war reality. Dr. Aomar Boom, professor and Maurice Amato Endowed Chair in Sephardic Studies at UCLA, will discuss why the history of the Shoah and North Africa has been so widely ignored and reflect on what we have to gain by understanding it in all its nuances. This program is part of our Sephardic and Mizrahi Stories series, exploring Sephardic and Mizrahi culture, history, and experiences. Dr. Aomar Boom is a professor of anthropology and, as I mentioned, the Maurice Amato Endowed Chair in Sephardic Studies at UCLA. He is a sociocultural anthropologist focused on the representation of and political discourse about religious and ethnic minorities in the Middle East and North Africa. And in 2018, he co-edited the volume, The Holocaust and North Africa. Thank you all for joining us today for what I'm sure will be an enlightening program about this lesser understood history. Before we get started, please note that there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the program. You can ask a question by typing it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Aomar Boom. Thank you, Harmony. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. And I would like to thank also um, Holocaust, Holocaust Museum LA for the invitation to not only to talk about this topic, but also to continue to remember the victims of the Nazi and the Vichy uh, anti-Semitic anti and, and racial laws. This is a this is a project. I want to start by saying that this is a project that is the fruit of, I would say, years or probably a decade of collaboration with my colleague at UCLA, Sarah Stein, a colleague, other colleagues throughout the United States and North Africa, as well as the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, where a lot of the material that I will be presenting today is from there and from the archives also of Morocco, Israel, and France. So what I'm showing here is, is actually what I think personally for me is the result of a project of collaboration that involves faculties, involves students. And I think that's the, that's the type of work that we should be doing across disciplines, across universities, and across regions. So the story I'm gonna talk about today is just one, one part of this big narrative of the connections between what happened in mainland Europe and how it reverberated in, in the Southern part of the Mediterranean. And it's really significant that I start this talk with the Mediterranean, with a ship that in, so I'll start with a story and it's part of many, many stories that happened between 1939, 1940, right even before the Nazi occupied Poland to, uh, uh, to uh, 1941, 42, and 43. Uh, these people, when we talk about many refugees, especially uh, we're focusing partly on the refugees, 
and how to position and to tell the story of these European Jewish and non-Jewish refugees who fled the Nazis and fled uh, fascism for hopefully for escape, but then some, some of them got caught in, in the middle of the war. So this is, a, uh, as I said, a so, this is a story of about um, 40, 83, 83 internees who in 1942, they were held in Camp Le Vernet, uh, Dariège, which is a camp right here. This was a, this was a camp that began as a site, as a, as a refugee site for um, uh, refugees who came from the, who fled Spain after the Spanish Civil War in 1939. So there was two major camps, Camp Le Vernet and Camp Gurs. But this camp in 1942, the internees here rebelled because they suffered from hunger and they suffered from mistreatment by the Vichy authorities. Uh, that were already in control of the southern part of, of, of France. And as a, as a result of this, they would be shipped to in a cargo, mostly for animals in what we call Jibel Amor. This is, this is a cargo that would take these 83 uh, refugees from Marseille to Algiers. And then from Algiers, they would be taken to different, and I stress here, labor camps throughout Algeria, as well as Morocco. And these are not detention camp or disciplinary camp. These are mostly labor camp at the beginning. And the, the most important camp is called the Camp Jelfa. So these are the names, some of the names I said 83, I gave the number of 83 individuals. These are some of the names and you can see the difference as far as nationalities, as far as religions, as far as where they come from as well as the reasons for their internment at the beginning in Camp Le Vernet until 1942. So you have Armenians, you have uh, Iranians, Polish, Turkish, Romanians, Russians, Hungarians, and Germans. And these people were interned by the Vichy authority uh, for, political, for political activity, for communist propaganda, and for, danger, for being a danger for the, for the public order, and so on and so forth. These, some of these internees were also, uh, most of them, as I said, the, while the majority of them happened to be people who participated in Spanish Civil War from different, uh, uh, they were part also of the International Brigade uh, from uh, Latin America, from the, from the Americas, from Canada, from uh, uh, Russia, as well as from other European, uh, from other European countries. But then other people were not part of the of this what we call Spanish um, refugees or Spanish Republicans, they don't come from that history of the Civil War. They also come from people who just fled um, Germany or fled other European countries as Hitler gained power over the years in the 1930s. So and then they ended up in France by 1939 and by um, and 19 early 1940s most of these people will start to be basically taken and seen as what we call undesirables. So where is this notion of undesirables come from? This is really at the core of what, of, what of, a lot of the work that has been done recently by many people who have become interested in this, in, this, in this period of the war or in this part of the war, including my colleague and even uh, Sarah Stein and other, and other students that have been working with us on this project. So the, end, the idea of the undesirables come from a, 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 a Vichy philosophy of why France lost the war and why France um, um, being occupied by, by Germany le, le, got to this, what, what Vichy authority calls this, this uh, stage of decadence. And the idea for them is come because they, 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 they left the core, I, the core idea of being French, which is basically the peasant. So the whole philosophy is built on the notion of the peasant, the notion of the land, and the notion of toiling the land. And that's what that's what we've seen as this idea of what is a true a true French could be. So to be basically reeducated, you have to be. You, you stress this idea of not only the peasant, but also you stress the idea of family and work and nation. So this is. 
this is this is something that's separate from the other the other opposite notion of the people who don't fit in this category are generally referred to undesirables. So what 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 role they have in this in this Vichy uh, system? Can they be redeemed or not? For some people, they might, but they have to to have to be put in a different context of work. And that's where most of these people that I will be talking about happen to be were sent either into internment camp to in or sometimes the death camps in, in mainland Europe or to labor camps outside 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 of outside of mainland France. And that's where North Africa fits into this model of how do you use this labor instead of killing them, you you, you could use them in a in, in other project that potentially would bring back France to its apogee and to its quote unquote civilized civilized status. So, so this is where this is where most of the um, the, the, the Vichy camp in a, in, a, in, a, in in general, and this is you, if you, when you when you go back to actually to the record to the archival record, you don't see a lot being talked about, but you do see in how for, you do see some references to nature and Vichy and internment, especially when we talk about forests, for instance, in the context of Gurs, for instance. But and then the desert becomes also part of this, especially when you use the mines. So across North Africa, this is, I'm, I'm mentioning here mostly, this is a, a map that's uh, copied from our uh, first um, edited volume that uh, the Holocaust of North Africa. And all these, these places that you see here, these are either villages or cities and around them, they were, they were uh, tied to one camp or another. And these camps were part of a, of a as I said, a labor system that was meant to put together a railroad throughout uh, Algeria, throughout uh, Morocco, mostly to connect it to what we call the Sub-Saharan Africa and, um, and, and mines also across the Sahara to use these raw material for um, industries in, in France uh, and, and ship these, in, these raw material through, through the Mediterranean. So in a sense here, what I call the Vichy camps here are part of this revival of the colonial honor, but they're also part of what we call also a circulation of different refugees and different um, internees throughout these camps. So you don't see, as I showed you just in this, uh, um, in the first image that of this boat, where you have these um, refugees or these internees taken in these cargoes to, uh, uh, to, to Algeria. And then from there, they were distributed or they were sent across uh, the Morocco and Algeria to these different labor camps. You have also this idea of circulation of the different workers across these internees, especially when they don't follow, the, when, when they don't follow the rules of the camps. So, uh, so instead of being set up in or put in a labor camp, they sometimes get sent to disciplinary camps or sometimes to the, de the de detention camp. But the detention camps were mostly camps that were reserved for families, sometimes children with children and 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 women. And these are there are very few of them. You don't you have the majority of these camps were mostly labor camps that they mentioned. But you have, for instance, Sidi Ayashi here in in uh, the coastal uh, in the Atlantic coast of Morocco. This is a camp that was you, where you had a lot of kids and 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 women. This, and there is a camp also just out, uh, not um, inside Casablanca, within Casablanca, the city of Casablanca called Medina, and so on and so forth. So that's so that's just to to highlight this notion of how the what is the the most important topic actually that's been debated and discussed in this context of racial laws that were introduced twice in 40 and then 41 and then from this for how these racial laws were tied to the racial laws that that was set up in 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 France and they were actually applied in in Morocco in Algeria and Tunisia and they affected mostly they affected mostly the Jews and foreigners, um, and to a large extent, I would say, the Algerian Jews who were at the time citizens of, of Algeria. So they were Algerian, uh, they, so, sorry, they were citizens of France. But as far as Morocco and Tunisia, we don't see a lot of 
um, to, uh, Jews, uh, even even Algeria, I would say Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco, indigenous Jews, they were not part, they were not interned in these camps, with a few exceptions. So so I want to separate here that in the population you have about half a million Jews, native Jews to North Africa in the region at the time, they were not part of this system, but they did suffer from the anti-Jewish laws and the racial and the racial uh, laws that were introduced by Vichy government in terms of losing their job, in terms of being expelled from schools, in terms of uh, being denied certain professions and so on and so forth. So, that, so that's a separate. In a, uh, as far as the Jews who were uh, um, caught in the middle of the war, when they were in mainland France, Jews native to Morocco and native to Algeria, and native to Tunisia and Libya, many of them end up actually uh, being, a lot of them were sent to death camps in, in Auschwitz and, and, and other camps where many of them uh, died. So um, in addition to this, to this story, to, to, to these um, uh, uh, stories, I wanna also highlight the fact that North Africa, um, when we talk about these stories of refugees, but stories of the war, people fleeing, fleeing the Nazis and fleeing the fascism in Europe in the 1930s and early 40s, there was a lot of people actually who had to go through North Africa, they had to go through Tangier, which was an international zone at the time. They have to go through Casablanca, they have to go through West Africa. And so this is one of the, so when you read, when you read through a lot of books, a lot of um, novels and biographies that were written about the war and people fleeing the war, you see references to North Africa, but we don't, we haven't focused a lot on this. And this is the reason why uh, we have different scholars. We, we at UCLA, for instance, we're trying to really broaden this narrative and try to uh, touch some of these, some of these stories and also people in, in, different, in different institutions in different Holocaust memorial museums in the United States and outside the United States, they're trying to also shed light on this narrative by expanding uh, the frame and touching on these and shedding light on these, on these stories. So this is for instance, an example of the, the, the what do we call the, the very famous novel, The Kirk Family, who, um, whose, whose members had to go through different trajectories and including some of them uh, had to go through, as I said, Tangier and Casablanca. Um, the, another another, another uh, story that's just as, as part of these European stories that touch on the North Africa, but they didn't go deep into this narrative. You have, for instance, what we call the, the, the Sophie Freud's book and her story with her mother and, uh, and through their, their experience in, in, uh, in Casablanca. There are also stories of, of, of people who served during uh, in, the, in the French uh, army, the French uh, liberation um, army. You have a story, for instance, of Camillo Adler, who, and the story of, of the, um, as a, as not only as a refugee, but as somebody also who, who, who served in the French uh, liberation with the liberator, but, as, but also before even, before even the Nazis occupied, occupied France. But the most important thing, and this is a, this is a this we get to um, to to talk a lot about what has been written during uh, the war by people who were interned in these camps. We don't find a lot of the, of the of the of the stories, unfortunately, but we have a few books, especially by Max Ob, who has written a lot about his experience in 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 the camps in Jelfa and the, the camp. That, I'm, that I've written a lot about. I'm very familiar with this camp, but also in, in other camps. And, and the reason why Max Ob was very successful at not only writing about this, but also at making sure that what he wrote survived the, um, the, the French, um, because the French, as I said, getting back to nature again, one of the reasons why we see these camps in forests and these camps in deserts, because the nature itself in the philosophy allows the erasure and erasing these memories. So, so that's something that we don't have, we're still, uh, people are aware, local people sometimes are aware of the existence of these camps, but they don't have a detail about them in terms of, uh, in terms of who was there and why. So they would just have faint memories. When I've interviewed people uh, who lived in, uh, in, in some of these, in villages where the, worst, where, the, where the camps were just a kilometer or two kilometers outside the city or outside the rural settlements or hamlets. And 
their, their memories are faint about this. So in a, in, to a certain extent, unlike the Nazis who were good at recording it, or he made sure that they recorded everything and then cataloged everything, the French did not do that in, in, in North Africa. So this is uh, some of the pictures we have about the, the, some of these camps. You can see the, the, that, um, th that you, with these, what we call the Arab chants here, once, once these were erased, so how you, you have to have an archeology span of the Holocaust to, for instance, to, 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 to know what happened in these places and how people lived in this, just from what's left there. And if we don't have the oral history, if we don't have, for instance, the texts that were and the recordings and the material that was hopefully captured by, by the American um, army and the allies after the uh, Operation Torch. And so this, some, we do have a lot of images that were left. And the, these are, some of these images are for instance, housed in the United States Holocaust and Order Museum and other private collections, family collections, and, and also uh, collections that are tied to uh, different institutions across the globe. So as it, you can see also the, the dominance here of the railroad, but this is a different railroad that you see in, in Europe. This is a railroad that was tied to mines because the, 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 the idea was to basically maximize the extraction of these resources for the particular industries, different industries, not only tied to Vichy uh, economy, but also in some extent, to some extent, some of the mines like the cobalt mine in a, in a camp, uh, sorry, in, in a camp south of, or in a camp and a mine uh, south of Marrakesh in Morocco, where you had a cobalt, the importance of cobalt, and that's called Camp Bouazet, but the Germans had an eye, had their eyes on, on it. So that, there are actually a lot of reports and, and, and the writings about that coming from the German administration and the German spies who were already uh, present in Marrakesh by 1940. Sorry. And then in, in, in addition to this, what we have also, we have people who were involved uh, the, the other part of the story here is that people who were already involved in, in what, what we call the um, helping internees, support them and refugees. And, and these are basically not only the American French Service Committee, but you have also the joint, you have the, uh, the joint is already involved as, as early as 1939, 19, uh, sorry, as early as 1940, uh, where uh, Nelly Ben Attar was a, a Moroccan Due a descendant uh, from born in, Ten born in Tangier, then later on lived in mostly in Casablanca, were conducting her, her operation. It became really important. And then there is a very important book for those of you who are interested in this story that's just been published by Stanford University Press, and it's written by um, one of my one of uh, my colleagues and mentors, Susan Susan Miller. So I really I really um, encourage you to buy the book and read the book. It's a good book. Um, the, the last thing I want to talk about here is the, is the idea is that it, sorry, the last two things, first of all, the, the, the diaries, there were diaries that left mostly in Spanish, but some of them were translated into French. Not a lot of these diaries are translated into, into English, unfortunately, and I'll talk about that later on, the importance of translation to make sure that this type of knowledge is transmitted and communicated to readership across the United States or across the uh, English speaking uh, world and also in French. So I'm putting here two diaries again by Max Ob that I said one of the few people actually who left a lot of uh, report and material for us about this period and um, uh, another uh, uh, memoir or another diary left by a Muslim who, were, who was interned in, in the camp of Jelfa in and was also interned in other camps, including with some major, uh, with leading Jewish names like uh, from France, like uh, Bernard Lukács, who was at the time the head of the uh, LICA, the International League Against, against Anti-Semitism and Racism. So this is a, this is a, uh, it was written in French. It's not translated uh, into Arabic or into uh, English yet. So it's called three years in a, in, in a camp, in a disciplinary camp. So, the one you see on the right on my left is a, a memoir about 
being in a camp, in a disciplinary camp. And then the one you see on my right is, uh, is, a, is a labor camp, is a memoir about a labor camp. And we, we in, if you go to the, the records we have, as far as the reports about refugees, about their names, about how they were moved from one camp to another, and uh, for what reasons they were um, moved and all of these things, I think one of the key archives is the, Ameri the American um, uh, Friends Service Committee archives, which actually tied to the archives of Ellen Ben Attar, personal archives of Ellen Ben Attar, uh, Nelly Ben Attar, and other archives that are in known in the in the in the in the archives, National Archives of Morocco, National Archives of Israel. But also, fortunately for us as scholars, we have most of these archives housed in, and the majority of them housed in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. So the, the last thing I wanna uh, talk about before I conclude is what do we do with this, with, with this work? And, and I'm, I, I really, I go back to the first point I mentioned here, which the work we've been doing here at, at UCLA is that um, my, we, in, in 2015, we put together a, a conference on, on, uh, that's housed by the Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies on the, on the Holocaust and, and North Africa, basically looking at this, at this connection. We're not saying that we are the first ones to study this, but we're trying to expand it because I think some scholars going back to uh, the 1980s have already done that in Israel and France, but we're trying to really expand it, but also look, use different disciplines and then approach it from a di different disciplines. That's number one. And number two is this is, this is another uh, um, book that's actually tied to the first one that my colleague Sarah Stein and I and uh, graduate students from uh, UCLA, we have been, uh, we've taken a lot of material and translated into uh, English, material in different languages, translated into English. And then probably, I think, I would say this is probably one of the uh, first and really most important sources the source uh, documentary histories of the world that's available in English now, but translated from different languages. And it basically talks about the voices of ordinary people. We're not only talking about what has been done at the level of states, what has been done at the level of, of uh, bureaucracies now, what people, how people who live this war or people who went through these experiences talk about it in their own voices but translated all of it into in, in, in English. So, and then the other thing I wanna uh, stress here is that the, the medium, I also, um, uh, part of another collaboration, this is again, uh, this is again, that, uh, this is what I said, why, why I think we're not, I, I do believe that personally as an anthropologist, I do believe that it's very important to do this work, to collaborate with historians, to collaborate with artists, to collaborate with, um, other anthropologists, and not only in the U.S. but also across 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 uh, the Atlantic, and this is a project that I've been um, I've done I've worked on for the last for four years, which is supported by um, UCLA Allen D. Levy Center, supported also by institutions and private donors uh, across the country, also in Morocco, and this is a project that involves an artist, an Algerian artist, and me putting together or trying to showcase this story of how the connection, but through the visual. Because I think even though in, unfortunately in some uh, states and some counties and in this country, people are trying to ban comics and like one of the most important iconic comics of, the, of all time, Mouse, and uh, as a medium of education, now we, we, we believe that the, it's, the, it's important to write different mediums, just like we're doing source books. We're also, and then writing academic books that are geared to specific audiences. We need to expand this, the, the, the sources to reach as many audiences as possible and to make this information available for people to use it for educational purposes. And the comic book is important because first of all, it tells the connect, for me, it tells this connection between a German who's fleeing the war here, Hans and his father, Joseph, and then Johannes, who is a communist, basically trying to fight the rise of 
Nazis and Hitler to Makhlouf bin Nassim, a Senegalese uh, internee, a friend, a representative of the, of the Vichy administration, a Muslim and a Spanish Republicans. And, and by telling this story through these visuals, well, first of all, we tell the story, the story begins in Germany, it begins in Berlin and then in and, and, and Munich. And then uh, where you see here already, it, we provide the background of the period before the war period of the 1920s, right after World War I. And then we talk about life, economic life, social life, and, um, and the rise of the, um, the rise of fascism in, 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 in Germany, even prior to, prior to 1929, uh, prior to 1929 um, economic crisis that happened across the world, and then the emergence of the Nazis in, in the 1930s. So we tell this story, first of all, by laying out the, this context, and then we try to connect it to Paris because we see that Paris is central. It's, Paris is not only a place where, as I said before, a lot of Jews and people were fleeing, fleeing Hitler as early as 34, 35, 36, but also it's also a place where you have a rise of anti-Semitism happening in some parts of North Africa, especially in Algeria because of the, 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 the 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 uh, uh, settler uh, um, uh, um, anti-Semitic uh, settlers, and then you have the, so you have a movement on both sides. People coming from North Africa and people coming from Europe, and then hoping that Paris would and France would be the savior to see not to see basically France falling in the, uh, falling under the control of the of Hitler, and then uh, that would take uh, would lead. These um, to, to the introduction of anti-Jewish laws, which basically would force many of these refugees to seek uh, to seek uh, uh, safety first in North Africa, hoping that from Casablanca they would go to Tangier, and from Tangier they would fly to Lisbon, and from Lisbon they would end up in the Americas. And but also we deal in this in this graphic work, we we, we try also to tell a different story, the story of what happened in the mosque of Paris, because uh, my, for my colleague, Ethan Katz had written about it, did the, the, did the imam of the mosque of Paris, but Gabriel saved Jews or not. And then, well, then we'll talk about the question of the relationship between Jews and Muslims fighting anti-Semitism as early as mm, right before, after 1934, after the Constantine uh, events in Algeria, and then how that moved would actually be set up a stage of collaboration between Jews and Muslims in, a, in, in where the Lika was a central player in this as uh, from 34 until unfortunately the war, uh, the war started. And then that, that level of cooperation would, would, be, would, would, would almost end. And then the focus on this is not, is not why do you have a lot of stories, a lot of comics and a lot of graphic novels, a lot of biographies about the camps in Europe well, really what we want to do as a vision, as part of really using the visuals and images to, to, to tell this story is basically highlight life in these camps and how people lived. Sorry, let me just see your time. Yeah, how people lived, how people lived in, these, in, in, in these camps. Again, all of these material is, as I said, is coming from the archives. And what we're doing is not, we're not creating it. We are basically taking different stories Many, many, many stories, putting them together and creating a composite, a composite story that uh, Najib and I were trying to create. The artist Najib Berber and I, we, we created this composite story. It's a composite story that did not only talk about Spanish Republicans or Jews, but it talks about relationship between uh, different faiths in within the camp because a lot of people were from different. They were Muslim. They were uh, they were Jews. They were some of them people Christians. But there are also uh, Jewish communities also not far from these camps where Jews were not in these camps. So we're also telling another story about the, 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 the role and the connection between these camps, these European Jews and non-European Jews, and the local indigenous Jewish communities in, in these deserts that, that Sarah Stein has written about it in, in a book, in, in her book on, on the Jews of the Sahara. So this is, this is just this is just one uh, 
so to complicate the story, it's not these camps were not sealed off the real world. They were they were places where, unlike the camps in Europe, people this this is what this is what the at least the Vichy government and the Vichy authorities wanted to, these internees to these internees to, to feel is that they are still they're not seen as prisoners. They can still work, but they can still have access to the outside world to, to go to the villages, the neighboring villages. And then the last thing, which is which I think it's 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 it started to emerge in a lot of writings, as as I said in Europe, uh, which is where the African Americans fit in writing World War II and the Holocaust in general. So I want to we want to reflect on that where you see where we tell the story, for instance, of how the Nazis basically massacred a lot of um, uh, uh, black soldiers who were part of the Senegalese soldiers and West African soldiers who were part of the French army when they took uh, control of, of Paris, of France, uh, which, has, which is sometimes connected to the, their feelings about, uh, or their, about the role of a lot of uh, these soldiers during World War I. But in addition to this story, we want to tell a story of also the Senegalese or the West African, with the West Africans who were part of this history, but not talked about it in a very broad way. We tend to focus mostly on the soldiers who were part of the French administration. There, but there are stories of Senegalese and West African soldiers who were also interned in these camps for political reasons, for um, refusing to be part of this, this the system and the machines of um, uh, subjugating internees or, or um, uh, enforcing the rules of, of these administrations. In addition, also we we'll talk about a few, some collaborators from, 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 the, from those sides. So, so it's, it's a story that reflects in some way what emerges from the archives. And hopefully it would be a story that would be useful for K, uh, for the uh, high school kids, for uh, undergraduate students in in taking Holocaust 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 uh, classes, just like the the source book that I, that I already talked about would be also uh, useful for that. And then the last thing, this is a this is these are images that I just took. I was in Morocco. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't go to uh, Algeria, but I would. But it would be really because you just you see this mountain here just outside on just on the other side that's the it's not far there is a border with algeria there and you can see that this system this railroad system was meant to connect it has nothing to do with morocco algeria it was meant to connect all sides of all mines to make sure that as i said it's part of the extraction of these resources for a for for a for a um, for mainland for mainland uh, french economy mostly that, that Vichy had in mind. And then you, what you see is, is that these sites now are remnant. So the sites where you can see the railroad, what remains of the railroad, some of it actually uh, is not, most of it has been taken uh, and some of it is still, still intact. And some of the, some of the, and you can see also some of the camps. This is Camp uh, Tendrera, where you still see the, the main train station, you see, uh, buildings where the internees were were held, but you only have a few of the camps where these structures are still standing. The majority of the the majority of the of, of the camp actually, very few people would know these sites, and some of them will have been reused. So you have, I there are camps that were at the beginning used as detention camps, and then later on were turned into hospitals or turned into schools, and so on and so forth. And that's that's part of a. Um, I, I think it's 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 a it's a, another project for uh, for students and for hopefully scholars to look at and to look at not only the how these sites are remembered, how these sites are thought about, but also potentially you can even part of the growing interest in what we call in this in the field of the archaeology of the Holocaust is how to think about these sites through not only history or anthropology or oral history. But also to think about it as as uh, through um, archaeology too. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Let me stop sharing.
Great, thank you um, very much. Uh, we now have some time to take questions from the audience. So just as a reminder to our audience, you can ask questions by typing them into the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, so we have a few to get us started. Um, we have a question here. Um, do you know what the kind of the total number of the Jewish population in North Africa before the war began? So before the war began, you have about, but this would shift at some point because if you think about, if you think about 1939, you already have some movement of uh, members of the Jewish communities of Algeria, for instance, already coming to Morocco as early as 1938, 39. So, but, the, but if you, the number you have is about 250,000 Jews in, in Morocco, about, 140,000 Jews in Algeria, close between 80,000 to 100,000 Jews in Tunisia, and around 60 to 80,000 Jews in Libya. And uh, if you add West Africa, um, which, were, which was connected, by the way, there were camps in, in some parts of West Africa, especially in Senegal and in, in Mali, uh, the Jewish population was very, very small. Uh, the biggest population was, mo was mostly in, in Senegal. So we're talking about, I would say, less than 50, uh, uh, between 50 and 100 Jews in that part of, 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 uh, of Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and we have sort of a connected question. Um, so were there concentrations of Jews in Morocco and Algiers? I you think you just answered that, but um, there's a follow-up question as to whether they were uh, the Jewish populations in, North Africa, were they subject to the same kind of roundups as um, European Jews um, or were it, was it more um, the, the racial laws that were in place less and less so the, the kind of police roundups that um, took place in, um, in France, for example? There, okay, there, we have to think about two things here. First of all, as far as the, the Nazi, let me start by making a difference between the different colonial powers, because we can't think about, can't answer these questions without situating it in the context of the colonial presence, European colonial presence in the region. So you have Libya was under the control of the Italians. France, uh, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia are under the control of, of the French. And to some, and for about six months, Tunisia was occupied by the Nazis, okay, by, by Germany. So, so at some, when you think about that, definitely in those moments, in those six months, there were things that might have, in terms of not roundup of all Tunisian Jews, but probably some people might have uh, been taken, if you, you, can, you can put the number in dozens and according to some historical records, and that's why you have a few Jews who actually were in, in Tunisia and ended up being sent to, to not a lot, I would say not even, uh, the number I know is about between two and five Jews who were, so, okay. who were taken to for political reasons. As far as the, the majority of North Africa, no, there is no, people were, people basically suffered from the uh, implementation of the anti, uh, for the racial laws, which basically, included people losing their jobs, lawyers. Uh, you have a quota as far as how many people can attend schools. Uh, people in, to certain, in some extent, to some extent, to some, in some cases, people forced to move to, the, to the, the old Jewish quarter because during the colonial period, uh, a lot, for instance, in the case of Morocco, you have a lot of Jews who left what we call the Mellah. It's not, I wouldn't say it's, the, it's not, the ghetto in the sense of Europe, but it's a Jewish quarter that was built for uh, historically, the first one was built in Fez and the second one was built in the city of Marrakesh uh, and was built basically to, for the sake of protection of Jews. And, um, and uh, that tied to the Sultan's, Sultan's protection. To, that's why most of these Jewish quarters were close to the palace, close to the, close to the, uh, close to the residence of the, of the Sultans. So most, in some cases, 
you have some Jews who moved from those quarters during the early period of the colonial period from 19, late 1910s, early 20s. And then once the, the anti-Jewish laws were applied and were in, uh, implemented, some of these people were forced to go back to the Malaf. So, but, and some of the people lost, some of the people lost their businesses. Uh, many would, according to the records we have, some of them would end up getting back that, uh, that properties. Mm -hmm. So some did not, depending on, 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 on who, but generally when you think about rounding up, it did not happen in the way uh, we talk about it in mainland, in France, for instance, or in Germany or other European countries. Thank you for clarifying. Um, we have a question um, from Alicia about the uh, the treatment of the laborers in these in these labor camps. Um, I know you mentioned that in some cases the camps were sort of constructed to give the impression that they were that the people in these camps were still part of the the surrounding community. Um, did that extend that kind of implication that they weren't completely detained extend to the way that um, they were treated by the people running these camps? It depends. It depends on the camps. It depends on the people inside. It depends on the regions. So of course you, you're getting the, this idea of, and the idea of labor, first of all, labor was meant to be in, in, in the discourse of the Vichy government, this labor was rewarded. So, but it depends on how much they were paid. So people, people were paid two cents, three cents per, uh, per day. They, uh, the idea of nutrition, how much food were they were given, but it was constructed as really, that's why I, start, I started my short talk by this idea of how work is embedded in, a, in an ideology, in a Vichy ideology of the undesirable versus the true French. So, so this idea that you're sending you there to work, but then if you don't follow those orders, we're gonna send you to disciplinary camps. So that's why you have a system, a network of labor camp, detention camp, and disciplinary camp. So when you are not following those orders in the way they were set up by the French um, um, uh, guards or the French uh, uh, military administrators, people were sent to these to these other disciplinary camp where basically they were they felt the harsh treatment compared to compared to the the, the, the labor camp. So and 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 then the labor camp we talked about, and that's why I said. I'm more familiar with Jelfa and the other few camps in Morocco, but because Jelfa, you can still, people have access to the neighboring villages. So we have people talking about uh, uh, going to a church, for instance, in the neighboring, or going to a synagogue, okay? People have access to sometimes to uh, hospitals if they are stung by a scorpion or by, or, uh, or, 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 or suffer from some health issues. So th there are these, uh, but it's not, it's meant to give this idea that you're living, you're working there. And, and some of these camps were even opened to international um, oversight. Basically you have mm -hmm. members of the, uh, uh, they were receiving uh, letters, they were receiving presents from some of them were receiving money, cigarettes and so on and so forth. So even, so Red Cross, like that kind of yeah. international aid, really? Yes, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. But it's um, not all, but, but it's, it depends. That's what I said, it's, it depends on the cases. That's why the Ellen, that's why I would really encourage you to read the book of um, uh, uh, Susan Miller, for instance, the good book that lays out exactly these larger connections. And, and I think it's, a, it's, another, it's another important source that allows us to really see how these issues and how these this treatment and the relationship between the people who are providing the support, people who are um, helping all the internees and the refugees, both the internees and the refugees look for their families as well as have access to some form of help, financial, as well as sometimes even food sometimes. 
can you speak a little bit about how um, the how these events, the um, the French racial laws in North Africa, how that impacts the post-war world? For uh, for example, for me, it seems pretty clear that uh, that kind of distinction between undesirables and the true French um, has a direct corollary to the, the conflict that France comes into in the decades following the war with its former colonial territories. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great point because also you have to think about it. If you look, and this is, I think, um, uh, a, another colleague of mine at, uh, at UCLA, uh, Leah Brosgar, has written about this. But uh, in the, if you think about the connection between a lot of the treatment of the PNR, for instance, and a lot of treatment of uh, members of the the uh, people who who were the the, the French military um, sort of the French treatment of a lot of um, migrants in the case of Paris, for instance, 63, I guess, or 60, 60, 63 or 62, that was, you have to, you have to link it also to the guards who were, who were, who were in these camps in, in Algeria, in Morocco, another part of North Africa. So I think, I think that's the, the, on one level, there is a connection, but also at the same time, there is a connection in terms of abuse and how these how these people who were during the war and during the Vichy period will later on carry on this psychology of oppression of not only of the, the immigrants, but also the oppression that was tied to how the people were treated in the camps. That's number one. But number two, you have also the human rights. Even I think a lot of you if you look at human rights uh, issues that emerged after the war uh, and um, were led by many uh, uh, French thinkers, I, I think, and French um, individuals and human rights, including Lika, for instance. Lika was, was at the center of that. But outside of the Lika, there were, others, there, there were other individuals who, who really pushed for this, uh, for, the, for the, the whole change and the whole uh, centralization of human rights and refugee rights based on what they've seen, based on the whether they lived it themselves or whether uh, or they heard it uh, from a secondary from a secondary source. I don't know if I I don't know if I if that's if I answered your question or if that or if, or yeah if I, I, I think it does. I think I was the the connections seem you know they're not quite as direct, but some the connections between these events and and things like the your, your response to the current refugee crisis yeah, yeah. of the last few years. It seems, you know, it it's, doesn't seem like a direct line necessarily, but it definitely seems like a stop along the way to, um, to some of the things that have happened in Europe and the Mediterranean um, and North Africa since. And, and for instance, I'll give you another, another example. So as part of it, so this is something that I'm working on with another colleague, a historian, and when you think about uh, Daniel Schroeder, uh, for instance, you think about the monarchy in Morocco, Sultan Sidi Mohammed bin Yusuf, who later on became Mohammed the Mohammed the Fifth, King Mohammed the Fifth. Well, his connection when the first thing that, if you look at his connections to the Lika, to Bernard Lukash, and to leading Jewish figures from France, especially from France, in the 55, 56, 57, was also part of this. And, it, and the human right component was really central in, in, in that, to the extent that he had an audience with Bernard Lokash and then opening, because the Bernard, they understood that in order to really push, which is tied to the 1930s, this is what's also tied to the 1930s uh, discourse about that to fight anti-Semitism, you have to have Jews and Muslims and Christians on the same front line, otherwise, you and then and then whatever affects one community, or on the long term, it can affect the other one. And then some of these leaders understood that. So with the war, there was a, a pause on, for that. But then later on, people start to revive it. We don't. And then, but the 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 what happened later on in the in the Middle East with the with the Arab-Israeli conflicts and all of these things, I think it really affected those conversations. 
But those conversations really, you're right, took place by the late 1950s. Uh, let's see, well, I think we have time for a couple more questions from the audience here. Um, so we have uh, a question of, have you personally interviewed anyone who was living in North Africa during the war? Yes, I've interviewed many people. I've interviewed uh, descendant of some of these, uh, actually I've interviewed descendant of some of these uh, uh, internees. I have interviewed Moroccan Jews, a lot of Moroccan Jews, some of, some of whom knew about these camps. And I've interviewed a lot of Muslims who were connected to these camps or who knew about these camps or who worked in these camps. So, and those, uh, so we do include some of these stories too in the, in the, in the source book, uh, but, but because I, I think it's really important to put together all these stories because all of these stories lead it in the same, to the same objective, which is basically to shed light on the, the struggles that a lot of these in, internees went through and these refugees went through, but also to be hopefully a, a lesson to future generations. Yeah, um, I think we have a great final question that I think ties into what you were just saying, which is uh, what can be done and what is needed to continue the study of North Africa and the Holocaust? That's a great question. I think you have, you have to maintain the interest, I think, and, and the interest start with the scholarship. I think, I, I think a lot of institutions in this country are, I think, doing the right thing by opening up, by looking, helping with the archives. I think we have to have ac access to the archive. And then also you have to have the support of these institutions who are doing this research and opening up, open, it, open this research and this knowledge and this, mostly this knowledge to other audiences through translations. I, I think that it, the, 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 the mistake that we have, I would say the mistake, but also I think where, where we fail to some extent is that you have two things that should go on. You have, first of all, to, inform people and make them see that these stories are relevant to them. And by being relevant to them is basically you have to look at it from their own history, from their own story, from their own background. Not to say that you have to minimize what happened to, to as far as the Holocaust and as far as the Jewish experience. But what I'm saying is that you have to, still make can keep the focus on that but at the same time look at it from their own history and then that's why world history is important that's why putting the connections are, are central that's number one and then number two uh, not everybody i think we in academia we 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 we, we write you've got amazing scholars brilliant scholars who write books and but we have also to an event like what you're doing today, that's, you have to communicate and translate this to a general audience. And, and, uh, and not only in English, but also in other languages, in Arabic, in French, in, uh, in Hebrew, in, in dialects, because I think, so translation also is an important part. And that's one of the things we, we try to do at UCLA is really, uh, at least uh, people in my, circles is that we believe in the importance of translation and translating the work we do to other audiences and to the audiences that what that we study so because that once you translate this 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 uh, this work you open up the other circles and other communities of readers and the reader uh, of readers and that those those would also be communicators of the discourse and of the knowledge we produce through this research that's 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 I think what I what I see is a is a is is important and 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 we're lucky and to be frank with you uh, we are lucky that we have a uh, 
at least I can speak about myself. I think uh, in my institution at UCLA, I think we're, we're, we have a great group and not only at UCLA, but the UC system, University of California system in general. We have so many scholars who work on these topics from a literature perspective, from history perspective, from anthropology, from sociology. And, uh, and I think the more we broaden these circles and the more we talk to each other, I think we'll be able to open these, uh, uh, extend this info information and this knowledge to larger audiences over time. Um, I 100% agree. And I think the there was a second part of that audience member's question, which said, can future talks look at other parts of North Africa and the Holocaust? So. Um, to our audience member who asked if we can do more talks like this, you're talking to the right person. Uh, Holocaust Museum LA wants to put on programs and events like this that our audience wants to hear. So um, if you have thoughts on topics, please reach out to, um, to the museum because we, uh, we want to give you content and, um, and education that you're interested in, in hearing. So um, please reach out to us. Uh, all right, I want to say thank you um, on behalf of, Hol of Holocaust Museum LA um, to you, Dr. Boom, for joining us tonight um, and for this really interesting um, lesson on a piece of history that uh, we don't often get a chance to talk about um, with our audience. So thank you very much for that opportunity. Um, before we sign off, I just want to uh, remind our audience that you can join us every week on Thursday at 11 a.m. on Zoom for our weekly Holocaust Survivor Talks. Uh, you can also join us uh, this Wednesday at 11 a.m. for a Q&A about the film Determined, which is uh, a film by Karen Perlmutter about her father's um, Holocaust survival story. The Q&A will feature Karen, uh, the film's composer and family members of the people who saved um, Abraham Perlmutter um, during the Holocaust. You can also find information about future events from Holocaust Museum LA on our website at holocaustmuseumla.org. Uh, a recording of this program will be made available on Holocaust Museum LA's uh, YouTube channel uh, in the coming days. Holocaust Museum LA brings you programs like today's at no charge. If you are enjoying our programs, please consider supporting our work by becoming a member. To learn more about our membership levels and benefits, visit holocaustmuseumla.org slash membership. Uh, and just as a reminder, uh, if you are interested in any of the books that uh, Dr. Boom mentioned during his talk, there are links in the chat. Uh, we will also send links to some of those books uh, in a follow-up email tomorrow. So you'll have another chance if you couldn't quite find the link. Um, thank you again, Dr. Boom. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, and I hope everyone has a very good evening. <laughs>